Good morning, everybody. My name is John Taylor from Bic Innovation. This is the webinar for other people's money. So we're going to talk about equity finance. Uh, joining me this morning is Jordan Thomas from Capital Law, Mark Neath from Old Mill Finance, uh, Alan Thomas from Development Bank Wales, Anthony D'Souza from Crowdfunding, and Hugh Thomas from Puffin Produce and also from the uh, Welsh Food and Drink Board. So Hugh, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, just a bit of an introduction from me um, to explain how this work has come about. Um, I sit on uh, the Food and Drink Wales Industry Board, as John has just mentioned. And one of the work streams that we developed, you know, a few years ago now was uh, a work stream that will generally help business with kind of financial matters. Um, out of that came the Invest Ready programme. Uh, and this seminar is, seminar is part of that work. You know, we've had a, a number of very useful seminars over the last couple of months. And I think this is now, you know, it's uh, building on the, the control mechanisms you need to run a business well. And I think we're now getting on to the next stages today, which is, you know, expand, expanding businesses, seeking equity finance, you know, M&A, these sort of things. I think it should be very useful. And, uh, you know, BIC are doing an ex excellent job uh, supporting the sector in Wales through the Food and Drink Wales Industry Board. Thank you, Hugh. Um, so, other people's money. Uh, today we want to talk about um, ways of raising capital uh, on the back of what we've previously talked about, which has been things like debt, asset finance, invoice finance, and sorting out and forecasting working capital. So, um, for more on those, see you morning. <laughs> happened but I'm back. Uh, okay so what is equity finance? Equity finance is where you exchange um, shares in your business uh, assuming that you're a limited company um, in, in return for capital. Um, you've probably seen Dragon's Den and seen pit people pitching for um, a small proportion of their company for a vast sum of money on something that um, uh, is difficult to quantify in terms of the value. Um, in other instances We've seen crowdfunding where people have got a business idea and they haven't got the assets as in they haven't got a, 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 more, a home they can mortgage or assets that they can finance. So they go to the share market, if you like, they go and ask other people, would they exchange capital for a stake in their business? And of course, it really depends on the strength of the business and the potential for future uh, revenues. It is, or it's seemingly complicated because there are different forms of, 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 of this. Um, we have different players. We have the private equity funds. It could be a pension fund who's looking for a return. They don't want to invest in, the, in many companies. Sometimes I could think of one pension fund that bought uh, a food and drink company because it provided them with a reliable source of revenue. So there are all manner of ways that people might look at the equity market, so to speak. On our, our panel today, we have uh, Jordan from Capital Law, who's going to talk about, or is going to be able to uh, talk around the subject of the governance and the share agreement that you might have. Because of course, you're ending a, essentially ending a type of contract with the people who you're taking money off. We have Alan Thomas from Development Bank Wells, because not only do Development Bank Wells lend money, uh, they also sometimes, and he'll I'll, I'll explain this, they'll sometimes take a stake in the business as part of the security for raising capital. So they'll take some equity. And Mark, Mark's from Old Mill Financial uh, Services and Accountants. Uh, they're one of the largest um, food and drink and agriculture um, services in um, the Southwest. Um, Mark's gonna talk about the slightly bigger deals that we sometimes see where we've got mergers and acquisitions. So. Sometimes, you know, two wrongs can make a right in as much as if you've got food and drink companies that push themselves together, they can, they can much more quickly grow and scale. So I think um, we'll, we'll, we'll kick off, if, if you don't mind, with Alan. I just want to talk about really the difference between short-term debt and equity finance. Because of course, Alan, we're talking about something that's a, a, a big decision. It's a long-term decision. You just don't dip in and out of equity finance, do you? No, you don't. It's a big commitment. Um, it's it, it's uh, an important commitment. It's it's there if debt capital isn't available. I, as you've said, you haven't got security uh, or you haven't got means or even in some 
case is you haven't got the income flow to show that you can pay for debt. But it's, it's, it, it can work. It can be very successful. It's important to understand um, that the equity provider is taking the same risk as you, the founder, really, putting the same capital in or similar capital. But then because it's the riskiest, they will need a, a reasonable rate of return or actually quite a strong rate of return normally. And normally they're looking for a reasonably um, quick exit. For, our, for institutional investors, it normally takes the, uh, the form of preference or preference cumulative shares or cumulative preference shares. And that means, as it says in the tin, they will get a preference on the dividend they're gonna pay. And if you can't pay it when it's due, it will accumulate and they'll get paid eventually. I think for me, it's very important that you don't do this quickly if you ever do it, and yet you align yourself with the right equity provider. At the end of the day, they're going to have a say in how you run your business, uh, and they're going to be involved in your business. So you want it to be the right partner who's going to hopefully, on the best sides, will open doors for you, help you uh, create the business you're trying to create and grow your business. On the worst side, there can be um, can be bad news if you don't align, if you're not the if their goals are not aligned with you as, then you've got a problem. Because if they're trying to get out when you're still trying to expand and you can't afford to get them out or they've got any other agendas, and in fact, we've seen this, John, and we were people have had other agendas, it can actually be very detrimental to your business. So it's something you should take a long time over considering. You should look at your opportunities in the market and look at the potential partners and what their goals are, if you like. Every equity partner is going to want to make money because they're taking a risk with their own money. But you've got to see what their other goals are and what their experience is and where it sort of suits, if it suits your business. And there's two elements to that, time and cost, isn't there? So we, we often talk about um, weighted average cost of capital, that calculation that says, well, if you added up all your debt and the cost of raising equity, what's the real interest rate that, you've, that the business is paying for money. Now, um, you know, it, it's easy to calculate in a way what the debt is costing you, yeah. not so easy to do. What in your experience is the, is, is the rule of thumb that you can maybe use for thinking about how much is this really going to cost us? Well, the cost is sort of time and energy. Um, it takes generally a minimum of two months to put an equity investment together, and that's quite quick. So it always it often surprises people, but really it's going to take two, three, maybe four months, even more, and it's going to be your your time and energy that's going to be consumed in that. And even when it's done, then your reporting has got to be uh, spot on. Your management accounts, your KPIs, because your equity provider will want all that information, want it timely. So there is a cost to it. So your coupon, if you like, your dividend is your your six, your seven percent compared to your loan rate of your six and seven percent. But then there's a lot more rigor around it, time, effort, legal fees, as I'm sure Jordan would uh, agree, uh, and accountants' fees. So yes, it is going to cost you more than normal debt because it is the riskier capital and it takes a lot more rigor to put it in place. And that cost, I mean, in a way, it's a sunk cost, isn't it? It's money that yeah. you invest in a process that the longer that you can amortize that cost over in a yeah, way... Better the cheaper that, that you, you're defraying that cost over uh, uh, hopefully growth and scaling of a business. C correct. And that's, that's again about aligning the goals of the equity provider with the business. If you get an equity provider who thinks he's going to, he or she or institution is going to get the, the money back through the three times multiple in 18 months. And yet you've got a long-term plan. That's a 10 year plan. You obviously got an issue. Yeah. Because so after 18 haven't... months, you haven't matched up with the right investor yeah. Yeah. and we'll yeah. come 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 back to that because i think some people think crowdfunding is the solution for getting a, a quick deal and i think anthony's going to disappoint them in a moment but jordan <laughs> that point that alan, alan raised about uh, the the getting making sure that you've got an agreement apart from the sharing the vision and the mission of the of the organization so that people understand what they're investing in there's also some detail that they need to think about in a shareholders agreement. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of the um, common areas where, you know, it goes to the heart of the relationship with that invest, there are obviously a lot of time written down into the document. So it's things as Alan touched upon information and financial um, information that investors will require or, um, you know, consent rights of certain things that you, you can't do without first seeking investor consent. They'll be set out quite fully in the documents and often um, need to be sort of a bit of a balancing act that won't detract from what you do 
day to day in in the business. But you know, it, it's absolutely you know I can only echo what Alan said about you know the the, the relationship and having that right partnership with an investor because um, those are kind of the, the two key areas where things do start to go wrong. You know, if you're not transparent with your investor and they start losing trust in you, then it's going to be a really difficult, long, laborious process. And obviously all that does is, is detract from, from what you, you should be doing in, in running the business and progressing it. So that as well, you know, the, the transaction itself, three, four months, you will have something else on your plate to, to have to worry about. So the finance is you know, quite all consuming. So you've got to have that in mind as well. So it's, it's a distraction from running the business. 100%, company. yeah. It's in effect selling some of the business because you're introducing capital in return for a stake in the business. What, but there's also that shared vision. I mean, I know people who've invested in businesses successfully. It took them a year before they'd, they'd been rubbing along together happily, before they all agreed, yes, they could work together. Some people seem to think they can do that much, much more quickly. Is there a sort of generic shareholder agreement? There are some general rules that people could look at to sort of say, is this the sort of agreement I want to get into? Yeah, so, you know, whatever, whatever form of equity finance you're looking at if it's angel crowdfunding institutional there's always going to be the common area so it'll be um you know warranties you have to give to that investor to say you know yes my business is is is, is all a-okay you know we, we own our ip we're not in, involved in any disputes it's all those sorts of things you'll have um what, you know obviously it'll set out what what does happen if things go wrong so restrictive covenants bar and user founder from actually going up and setting up a competing business um, if you do leave, what happens to your shares? If it's within a you know certain time frame, you know in like in line with that exit um, point. Obviously, if you leave the business within three years of an investor putting their money in into the business, they're obviously investing in you. So that's going to be something they they're going to want to recoup on their investment and ensure that you don't benefit from it. Um, so yeah. So in, in terms of the, the shareholders agreement, they're often um, normally very much the same form, regardless of what the, the type of investment is. It's just that obviously they become a bit more, um, more, more meat on the bones, the more kind of professional and um, sophisticated the investment gets. So it's, it's, it's what you would otherwise call due diligence. It's effectively understanding what you're getting into, not just from the yeah. investor getting into the business, but what you are offering the investor. Yeah, and, and I think it's often a, maybe a bit of a culture shock. And, you know, a lot of founders, they, they're only really got themselves to answer to with with businesses and it's almost like, like handing over a set of keys to to a house you know you've got somebody else that's got an interest now that you're, you're accountable to um and that can as you say it might take a year or it may never match up in terms of, of you being on the same page with your investors but there is that kind of phase where actually you need to realize that it's not just your money anymore that that is is in the business and you are accountable to other people and you need to be open and transparent with them it's what it's what we call a fiduciary duty, isn't it? Really, you're, you're there to be there for the benefits of the shareholders. You might be the biggest shareholder, but you still have the shareholders to consider. Yeah, absolutely right. So you know, um, if, if obviously the mo most of the investments we do uh, involve companies uh, taking on investments, so the directors of those businesses will have um, statutory duties which are written into law that uh, mean that you have to put the best interest of the company and, and by virtue of uh, shareholders. Uh, sitting behind that first you know you've got, always got to have their interests in mind and um, make sure you know things like not putting yourself in, in conflict with your own personal interests or other directorships or other things you may have going on so yeah very much you, it, it's a bit of a, a shift I think when you take on investment because it's it's quite a gray area where it's just you as a sole founder of a company you, you are doing everything for your own benefit whereas when you, you take on investment and other shareholders you you are you are working with other people and you've got other people's money money to think about yeah um so there's management buyouts and there are in angel investors there's crowdfunding and of course it could be that you get a stake taken in you by another company who've got a vested interest in realizing the synergies of more than one company mark um old mill facilitate those sorts of agreements where where do you look for the the people who are um aligned and how do you understand if they're aligned and we'll just take you off mute if we can. There we go. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I've got on mute, and I must apologise for sod's law. Someone's digging up the road outside, so I apologise for the background noise uh, and why they decided to start that now whilst we're on a on a webinar. But uh, there we go. Um, so, uh, 
the shared vision. I mean, when 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 yeah. when companies are looking for mergers and acquisitions, surely they're looking for uh, companies that are a genetic fit, but but also it's not just a financial calculation. The management fit, the the the, the sort of shared vision of where the market is going and how that opportunity can be realised. Uh, that's right, uh, and also where um, additional profit can be generated, uh, because often with um, particularly. Uh, sort of early stage businesses and those that are on a, a growth path, uh, you have to make uh, kind of step investments in fixed costs. Uh, so you know it's it's hard to recruit part of a person. Uh, you have to have generally whole, whole employees, full time employees. Um, you need a certain size of building and enter into a lease for um, a period. And a lot of um, businesses tend to operate at under capacity. Uh, and therefore aren't generating the profit that they uh, ought to be from um, the overhead base that they've got. Uh, and we see that across you know, all sorts of industries, all sorts of businesses. Um, if you are in that sort of situation or you have a couple of businesses in that kind of situation, then combining their two revenue streams into one um, set of overheads, uh, if, you, you know, if it is possible to, to run the two businesses together, could enable you to make a lot more profit together than you, you would have uh, alone. So the companies that where you've got, particularly in food and drink, where you've got either spare capacity because you have a seasonal peak that you've got to, um, you've got to be available for, or where you're looking at joint buying and uh, competencies within the business that can be maybe diversified if somebody else has got a brand that can exploit the capacity that's available for um, part of the year. Uh, that's right. Um, or it may be um, financial strength. Uh, so um, getting together with a business that has the money to invest in marketing and getting your product to market uh, or into you know, the, the, the multiples. Uh, because uh, you, you may find that um, you know, by partnering with a larger company that's already established within um, you know, a couple of the major supermarkets, gives you the contacts and ability to step forward that you wouldn't or otherwise be or would take a long time to achieve um, from your own efforts. Thanks, Mark. Uh, just for everybody on, on the webinar, we have the chat function. So if you've got any questions, please do um, pop them up on the chat function and we, we'll try and address those as we go along. Um, so uh, crowdfunding has become very fashionable for food and drink companies, particularly those who don't have a lot of asset backing. Um, and seemingly you can raise money very quickly from crowdfunding or can you Anthony what's what's the secret to getting other people's money through a crowdfunding platform well the secret to crowdfunding is in the name in other words you need a crowd in order to go crowdfunding so um, that means you've got to bring along your own crowd to your uh, crowdfunding campaign first in fact uh, a lot of these campaigns will actually uh, have that as a requirement so in other words, within the first um, studies have shown that within the first 24 hours of launching uh, your crowdfunding campaign, um, you need to have at least a third of your funding in at that particular point. So um, that gives you an idea, firstly, of um, how much you can set your target at. And also, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a psychological thing. So in other words, the first third of your uh, funders come from your uh, immediate network. The second third of your funders will probably come from the investors who are actually registered on the platforms themselves. For example, Crowdcube, which is one of the two biggest uh, equity crowdfunding platforms in this country, um, are, um, they have over 750,000 uh, potential investors. So typically that's where the next uh, third of your funding comes from. And then obviously when it comes to the last third, well, you know, those are other people's crowds. So in other words, you need to somehow um, um, make connections and uh, uh, with, with the other people's crowds so that your message can be put in front of other people's crowds. So typically that's how that, um, um, a crowdfunding campaign's money would flow through a, a campaign. So normally there's, um, so, so when it comes to crowdfunding, I mean, it's now, um, a fixed part of the financial landscape, as it were. Uh, the UK is the world leader 
uh, when it comes to equity crowdfunding because uh, they were allowed by the regulators, the Financial Conduct Authority, to establish themselves. And there was a sort of light touch regulation over the years and it allowed them to get out of the starting gates. And, and the two biggest platforms that serve the space is Crowdcube, which is based out of uh, Exeter and Cedars based out of London. And both of them have helped um, um, raise um, a lot of money, in fact, close to a billion on each platform for about a thousand businesses on each platform uh, since they've been going. So a lot of businesses have actually benefited from a lot of um, a lot of uh, investment from a lot of people. Um, crowdfunding is often referred to as a democratic form of finance. So in other words, um, um, people can invest as little as 10 pounds in a particular campaign. So you get a, lots and lots of people coming in with small amounts. And at the end of the crowdfunding campaign, you end up with a large amount. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an exciting way forward for any business to consider. Um, the World Bank, um, uh, reckoned that this year crowdfunding globally would uh, become a hundred billion dollar industry and um, and what I have found is during COVID for example that there's been a tremendous increase in crowdfunding as a way forward for businesses but yes there are a lot of things that you've got to take into account when it comes to crowdfunding it's not a quick fix as it were um, and to me, probably the best way to figure out equity crowdfunding is to go to one of these two platforms, register on them as a potential investor yourself, and go and back some crowdfunding campaigns. For example, in the last, uh, since COVID, I've backed, I think, five, five different uh, companies on, 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 on these uh, websites. And what you do is when you do that, you get a feel for how this works from an investor's perspective. You've got to understand the investor's journey as well as the need for you wanting to raise money for your business as well. So go and do that. Become an investor. Check out their video, their pitch deck, their financials. In other words, go and have a look at some of the case studies that are actually mentioned on these uh, crowdfunding campaigns because you'll learn a lot by looking at um, at, 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 at how this all works. And yeah. Uh, the, 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 I mean, they, uh, just to answer a question, this couple of months, you've got um, Crowdcube and we've got Cedars as the two main platforms for, for this. Um, now, um, Alan is saying it's uh, about two months. Jordan was saying about three to four months. Anthony, how long to get a successful campaign that's going to raise the right amount of money? Well, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, you need to understand that there are a whole lot of success factors that you need, even need to have in place before you go crowdfunding. You don't need to have them all in place, but you need to have enough of them in place. And, and uh, to me, 80% of the work is done before you hit that uh, uh, crowdfunding launch button, as it were. So in other words, you've got to understand all the different components and um, you've got to uh, make sure that you have enough success factors and um, for example, one of the success factors is, is, is choosing your actual target, you know, um, can your crowd deliver on your target? In other words, have you done enough work to reach out to them? Because fundamentally, you've strangers... Build, what you're saying is you've got to build a base to start with, so you can't just go in cold. You've already got to have, as you said, one third is probably going to come from your own customer base, potentially, people who are stakeholders or customers of your business. Correct. You know, there, there's, there's, there's another factor that uh, a lot of people miss, and that's, that is strangers do not back crowdfunding campaigns. So in other words, um, they either know you or they know someone who is invested in your campaign, or they know someone who has, say, a PR outlet, whether it be online or a blogger or a journalist or whatever the case might be. They know that particular person, but you've developed a relationship with them. So, so fundamentally, Somebody always knows somebody along the line. There's not an army of backers out there or investors wanting to back uh, p p projects as, as, as such. So um, you've, got to, you've, 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 you've got to bear that in mind. Yeah. So what the, it doesn't sound quick. You're, so you're, you're not bettering the um, four months or two months of um, Alan and Jordan then. Right? Well, what sort of time span should people be planning for? Well, it differs. You know, the needs of each business, it depends on the, whether they're a, a, a real startup or whether they're an existing business and just want uh, funding for, for expansion. It, it all depends on where they are in the startup cycle, if you like, as to how long it'll actually take. And um, the further you are down that, uh, you know, from, from initial startup, 
to 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 a full on business. The further you are down that that line, as it were, um, the better your crowdfunding campaign is going to be. And what and what are the similarities between the successful crowdfunders and the and, and seemingly the ones that are unsuccessful? What are the common factors that you see as differing the two? Well, um, you know, uh, when it comes to um, equity campaigns one of the challenges is 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 valuations because you know you've got to decide how much equity you want to give away at the end of the day and uh, so coming up with a with 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 how much equity you you're going to part with is um is 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 obviously going to uh, impact on an investor's perspective of you and how you're going to uh, 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 go forward and because ultimately an investor wants some sort of exit at some point in 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 the life cycle of all of this. And when it comes to equity crowdfunding, an investor's money is tied up for between five and seven years before they get some sort of exit. And and not all businesses are going to exit either. So in other words, you're going to lose all your money. So- um, And what's the most often way of, because of course, sometimes you don't have any choice in exiting if the, you've only had a small portion of the business and somebody that Mark's organized comes along and does a, a large merger, merger and acquisition, it goes unconditional and you suddenly get a check for the valuation that they put on the business. Correct, correct. So in other words, an exit can be, can, can provide a return for investors, but it can also, you know, um, there's one in particular that I, I'm, I'm thinking of where uh, um, the investors only got 10p back on every pound that they invested. Okay. So, 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 it's considered an exit, but 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 it didn't um, it didn't make the per the investor any so Mark didn't do the investor any favors as it were. Yeah. So Mark, is that is that one of the things that we have to consider that these these things equity finance doesn't guarantee a happy ending? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, th that is the key factor of equity is that your money is at risk, uh, and you do have the possibility of total loss, um, and, and that's. It probably is something worth touching on the difference between debt risk and equity risk uh, as to why um, you know why we're even looking at equity. Uh, so if, um, as Anthony said, you're a long way down your startup phase and you're starting to generate reliable, uh, consistent, predictable revenues, uh, then you are in a position where you can probably go to a bank um, subject to security uh, and say look we've got this stream of revenue coming in we can service this much debt uh, as a result and we can borrow uh, so if you've got stable predictable uh, income cash flow stream uh, you're a debt risk uh, if you haven't got that then you're more into the equity risk territory uh, but just because you're not able to raise debt does not mean you're going to be able to raise equity uh, there are some businesses which are, are not suitable for either. Um, you know, they are more in uh, kind of the lifestyle category, or they are um, you know, individuals, entrepreneurs who you know, only themselves and their friends and family are going to invest in it at that stage. Uh, they, 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 yet the, got three the, F, the three Fs of finance. Just you mentioned the, the third F. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, the, the, the fools. But I mean, the the um, uh, I don't know what you had there. Um, I uh, I was just wondering the, the same questions I asked Anthony. You must see common factors that distinguish those companies. You think this is going to be one that we're going to get away, as opposed to this is going to be a problem. What are those common factors between the success and the failure to get equity finance? Uh, the key factor really is that the raising equity isn't raising finance it's more of a sales job uh, so a business which is trying has come to you to try and raise equity because they're unable to raise debt uh, is probably not going to um, get over the line uh, whereas one which is coming to you with this is our proposition um, we've got a strong sale we've built a crowd uh, as Anthony said uh, of users and um, advocates of the brand and so forth. Uh, then you've got a proposition that you can sell to investors, uh, be that uh, a crowdfunding platform uh, or individual angel investors. Uh, we've we've mentioned, touched on a few times institutional investors, but uh, really that market sort of starts when you're at a million of uh, profit. Uh, there are a few that, that play in the, the smaller space, but predominantly if you're looking at institutions, it's very large businesses. Uh, that are there. So, um, yeah, an equity 
pitch is very much a sales pitch rather than a, a debt proposal, which is all about here's the stability and security. Uh, equity investors are wanting the growth because um, you, you mentioned uh, the weighted average cost of capital earlier. Um, the cost of debt is very obvious. Uh, it's just the interest rate. The cost of equity is far more complex um, because it's, it's dividends, uh, but it's also capital growth. Uh, so investors would be looking for um, what us accountants like to call the internal rate of return. Uh, so that's the uh, kind of effective total interest rate over the whole life cycle of the investment, taking into account your, your exit, uh, which of course is very difficult to calculate in the absence of a, a crystal ball. Um, probably whilst we're on the subject of crowdfunding and angels, worth touching on EIS. Yes, please. Uh, so EIS um, is the Enterprise Investment Scheme, uh, and that's a, a tax advantaged uh, scheme um, allowed by HMRC. Uh, and a lot of CrowdCube uh, uh, or CEDARS um, proposals will go uh, with EIS assurance, uh, and that's one of the things they'll highlight on their um, on their proposal. And what is the uh, advantage? Because we hear EIS, we hear there's a tax advantage. How is that tax advantage? Yeah. Again, you've got to stick with it for a bit, haven't you? Uh, that's right. So um, when you uh, invest in an EIS company, uh, assuming it's all eligible and meets all the criteria, then you can get 30% of the investment back as income tax relief. So you put 100,000 in, get 30,000 off your tax bill. Uh, you can also defer uh, a capital gain. So if um, uh, this is quite common for people who've sold their businesses, uh, say, and they, they've got quite a large capital gain. You can defer the tax on that by reinvesting uh, the money. So you can potentially get 30% um, you know, income tax relief, 10, 20% capital gains tax relief um, going in as well. Uh, and then if, um, you know, like the example Anthony gave earlier, where the investors only got 10p in the pound back, um, you can get loss relief. Um, should it all go wrong so it does it softens the uh, the downside as well and with EIS because we've got a question here that's very quickly picked up on that point is how old is what are the qualifications if you want to get your company investable what are the rules in terms of its age and or EIS qualifying uh, there are many rules uh, so uh, Julie's thinking of CDIS so that's a, an enhanced version of EIS uh, which was launched uh, a couple of years ago uh, so yes in that case the business does have to be under two years old uh, and it has to be the uh, the limit on investment is smaller um, you can only put in um, I think 250,000 no more than 150 per person uh, whereas EIS is up to I think three million and there's no restriction on the age of the business for EIS? Uh, seven years. For seven years. Yeah, so you've got to be, years. it's got to be uh, incorporated in under seven years to qualify That's for That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it needs to be in a qualifying trade. Uh, so there are all sorts of things which are excluded. Um, sorry, Jordan, law firms don't qualify, uh, nor do accountants, uh, sadly, uh, nor do banks, uh, <laughs> uh, or anything property related. Uh, so if you're a property developer or running a a care home or a hotel the, the, those don't count but um we're talking mainly to food businesses so by and large you would expect them to be um eis eligible um you hugh just uh, one of the other forms of um equity finance of course is often attractive for mbos did you want to uh, just give us a yeah. uh, insight into mbos and how they might look at at uh, equity finance yeah well for, for those who don't know um I was part of an MBO of uh, the Puffin business about four or five months ago. Um, we were all the three remaining shareholders. Now we're all kind of existing shareholders at the time. But, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to get support from HSBC, High, High Street Bank, and managed to buy or um, cheap money within the business. So uh, we were lucky on the funding side, to be honest. But uh, I think what Jordan touched on earlier, John, is uh, the shareholder agreement was you know, something I was completely unaware of how long that was going to take. You know, you can, uh, you can end up spending a fortnight arguing about one point, if you know what I mean. So uh, that was a bit, you know, to, to keep enough tension within the business so that, you know, everybody is a, a little bit unhappy instead of one shareholder being really happy and another one being very unhappy. You know, that's uh, the healthy relationship that we managed to strike in the end. But that process took, you know, about 12 months, you know, so... Uh, you know, it, 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 was a, it was a long, uh, tortuous process. 
And how much of that is about being able to articulate what the business is actually about? And because that's surely what people are investing in is the future and the direction of the business. I think we were lucky enough to, for everybody to know where we wanted to go. You know, the, the three of them shareholders now, were, you know, we've all known each other and worked together for eight or nine years. We know, but, it, but it's all the kind of things that perhaps you couldn't predict in the future. If somebody gets run over by a bus or, or whatever, you know, how does, uh, how is the decisions made in the future, these type of things. So I think, uh, you know, I think it's one thing, you know, one of the lessons I learned was you never would want to sign something that, you know, would give you a legacy down the right line that would cause resentment or not allow you to work as partners. As, uh, as in not uh, dealing with the problem now, but kicking, kicking the problem down the road instead yeah. of addressing it there and then. Exactly. So, you know, we managed to hammer all of that out, you know, so we're all now in line. So, you know, as of the day it was signed, you know, everybody is... You know, back together and aligned and you know that, that took a long time you know so anybody that's you know looking at an equity investor don't underestimate how much time it takes to hammer out the detail so the common the common things that i'm getting from mark uh, uh, and from anthony uh, uh, and from alan is this you're actually selling a bit of the business aren't you so it's it, there's an element of due diligence on the one side but there's also of course the, the what are you going to do with this money and the shared vision and did everybody agree with where that was going uh, alan thomas coming back back to you again this is this doesn't sound very different to when you turn up at the bank anyway you've got to have a business plan you've got to have the vision the mission and be able to articulate it what are the, particularly because i know you sometimes get involved in in having some equity there as well is there any nuance between the two or is it really much the same discipline in that you've got to be able to manage the business well and demonstrate that? I think there's obviously overlaps, but I think there is a difference. If, if you're going to attract somebody to make an equity investment, I think the plan has to really have a focus on what its goal is as well, its end goal. So we can put debt into business because you're buying a factory, you're building a factory, you're just growing your business. And therefore you grow your business, you grow your profit margins, you can pay your debt. And that's fine. And that employs people and it's great. And that, uh, that's fine. But if you're asking somebody then to part with equity, real risk money, there needs to be a plan that says, actually, if we have this pot of money, we're going to use it to do this. And this transforms our business. And that's why in three or five years time, we can afford to pay you out or we become attractive as a target. The most um, successful ones I've been involved with have usually had um, a target in mind. They've bought a business with the pot of money. Why are they buying that business? Well, it probably um, integrates them up and down in, in, the, in their um, hierarchy um, of where they want to be, also makes them bigger. And often it is as simple as it gets them to a size where the big guys think, you know what, we need to buy them to get them out of the way. And that can be the goal. We get to a certain size, we've got so much of the market, and these can be 5%, 6% of the market. When the big guys have got 30%, once you get on their radar, they get bought. We did one with um, a telecom firm, and it was to buy a telecom, another telecom business and grow. And indeed, in fairness, within, I think it was a five-year plan, but it ended up with plan year seven. They got bought, and everybody got paid reasonably well through it but from day one the, the guy who was driving that said the reason is not just to grow the business to grow the business so you'll get bored so it's having that sort of it's not being um it's not being frightened about saying look this is what i want to happen this so is what I think is. the objective there then is sometimes i mean we've, we've seen this in food and drink and particularly in the 90s where we had dairy companies that would literally go and make and use of themselves with the big yeah. big boys and then somebody who from uh, from Surbiton would drive down in a nice car and um, before you knew it, everybody walked away and there was a covenant in the building that was never coming back as a dairy. Now that that's a that's a growth plan, but with a, an a, an immediate exit, yeah. the investors in that must know that's the plan. When it's slightly less defined, when you're saying, "Well, we're going for growth," um, how how you know how do you define what exit looks like? You know. Yeah, that can be difficult. So that often when you go in for growth, um, and this is the issue as an equity investor, to sustain that growth, you need more money all the time. You know, you may be making money, but the cash flow cycle says you need more premises, you need, yeah, not the cash, the cash flow cycle, your debt has grown, your stock has grown, but also you need more premises. So all of a sudden, they're sucking more money in. Um, so it's to show out actually what that growth, how that can become 
a strong profit margin over a certain time that you can hit a plateau, you can hit a certain length, of a certain size. So often we as a small equity investor are probably, uh, as Mark said, there isn't many who invest some sort of million pound, but we do, which is quite difficult. Um, we often see our exit as the bigger investors coming in. So they will so get to a certain extent. out of. That's right. So we get yeah. paid out so the bigger guys can put more millions in for it really to get bigger again. So and we're not, um, we, we are happy to know that's what's happening. We're there to invest in a Welsh business to make it grow. So we're quite happy that, you know, at some stage we can get refinanced out. And we've done, if you like, we've, we've performed our role by taking that business from 10 employees to 35 or whatever it is. And from 2 million turnover to 10 million turnover. But now it needs more money again. And because it's of a certain size, as Mark has said, it's making EBITDA or profit of a million pound bigger guys will, as you say, drive down from Serbia and then and, and pay us out. And that's fine. That's fine. What we don't like, beans we're talking about it, is when they pay, exactly as you say, when they pay it out and then they leave the factory empty. Yes. So we work very hard with bigger institutions to make sure the people they're introducing keep the employment in Wales and we try to work hard at making sure that happens. It's not always possible, but we try to make sure that the employment's kept. Um, one of the characteristics, surely, of food and drink, particularly in Wales, is that people sometimes want to buy the provenance. So it's not just a rate of return or capital growth. It's actually something that enhances the brand portfolio or it's something that yeah. gives them a point of difference in the marketplace. And of course, that's the pixie dust in why that brand maybe is attractive to people. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And, and this is, as somebody else pointed, it also can be counter-cyclical. It can be very different to the other brands because it makes a marriage. They're in the, everything's in the same sector for them. Sometimes they want to buy another brand because it's out of that sector and gives them a different angle as well, as you say. So it, it, there's lots of different reasons why a marriage can work. But it's, again, going back to our first discussion, it's really understanding what your investor's goal is as well. Yeah. You know. Before I ask Mark the same question, this, this, this point that, that's been raised about if you've got Bounce Bank or, or, or Sybil's loans already, that shouldn't be an impediment, should it, to an equity investor? Because from their point of view, they're, in, they're just as interested in you having access to the cheapest money possible and utilising it well within the business. Quite the statement in some ways, because it's, um, it's sort of saying you're putting debt into a business to capitalize it. Now, if it's cheap debt and it's used well, yes, it's opportunity cost. I guess from an investor's point of view, it's something else has got to be serviced. Um, not yet yeah, before they get their money, because they're the secured lenders. So it, if it's used, it's, it's all about how the money's used for me. If the money's used properly to create opportunity cost, create growth, then I think an investor can see that. If the debt is taken on and not used properly, then an investor is going to see, well, actually, all that's going to be serviced before my coupon or my preference or my dividend is going to be paid. So there's a couple of ways of looking at that, I think. Mark, can I just, because that's, I mean, we often talk about what does the balance sheet look like, you know, how, how obviously the balance sheet may not be in great shape if you're looking at the equity market because you've exhausted the uh, sources of debt. Uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, and as Alan says, it's, um, it's really about the risk to cash flow. Uh, so if a company is too highly geared um, for having too much debt, then um, the risk to an investor of the company failing uh, or being unable to, to pay dividends or actually to, to achieve um, the growth objectives is that much greater. Uh, so it potentially makes uh, a company less attractive, uh, but it depends how well well structured the business is. Uh, if um, you know a COVID loan has been taken and the cash flow forecasts show it can be comfortably serviced over the five years, doing what you're doing, uh, and then the equity investment enables you to make those uh, incremental steps on the top, uh, then that would um, not necessarily be a barrier. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, we've had the question from, from stewards is, has COVID actually changed the equity scene? And we, I know we talked prior to the, to the webinar that there seems to be an appetite for investment, mainly because, of course, the wholesale market is a flood with cheap money. So it's difficult to get a, a return other than by other means. And the equity market may offer that, Mark? Uh, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah we're, we're not going to get any money on our savings in the bank. <laughs> so uh yeah there, there's 
vast sums uh, out there uh, in private equity firms who are looking for acquisitions uh, and whilst they might um, you know, have a criteria which puts them above the market of a lot of businesses that we deal with uh, typically you would see uh, equity investors have a, a kind of core company that they will have invested in that meets that criteria and then apply a, what they call a buy and build yeah uh, so then bolt on smaller businesses, as we were saying earlier, into that to, to form a group and then exit that to an even larger fund or, or to IPO. So, so, so in a yeah, way, money could flow yeah, down. Unless you're the size of, of, of Puffin, in a way, the, the smaller food and drink businesses may be looking at the equity market, but via a larger parent company who's much more attractive and therefore the equity guys will be lending them money to buy up the smaller food and drink companies to en en enhance the value of the, uh, the, the, the total business then. That, that's one way out, yeah. yeah. And the characteristics of those businesses then, are, as Alan mentioned, I suppose, is, is being able to articulate that vision, but also um, to be able to demonstrate a rate of return internally, is it? Uh, yes, uh, and it's, um, yeah, it's about having the right type of business uh, you know brand something which a larger buyer can leverage uh, to you know, realize the value of uh, because that, that's where the t the return comes to them because they right. can do something with it that you can't right uh, anthony for those people who, who can't um demonstrate those sort of metrics and have more of an affinity brand i mean we've talked about um some of the provenance elements but there might be affinity um as well where people are doing things on the sustainability front so it's not just an immediate uh, investment in uh money terms to get a return but actually to make the world better or whatever it is do you see much of that in the, the crowdfunding side of things Yes, yes, there is a fair amount of that. Um, you know, there are a lot of businesses that want to launch uh, being aligned with the sustainable issues and, and, and various things like that, and therefore get a lot of interest and a lot of uh, backing as a result, certainly. So would, would crowdfunding platforms tend to be almost like that sort of alternative reason for investing to some extent sometimes? Um, yes, very much so, very much so. Okay, so we're, 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 ne we're nearing the end and I, I, as I warned we were going to do our, our top tips and, um, and, and predictions but um, Jordan can I coming back to, coming back to you I mean plainly um, having a shareholder agreement that is actually um, not just off the shelf but rewritten for the for the circumstances is plainly one thing what are the what are the key elements that should be in there if you were giving advice to anybody watching this today about what should be in a shareholders agreement and what they make sure isn't in one in case things come back and bite them? Yeah, so I think any, whatever the, the type of equity finance there is, there's always gonna be certain elements of the same thing. So warranties, restrictive covenants, as I said, consent matters, information rights. So I don't think I would so be amazed. Pick up on that, the consent. Yeah. So this is what the management can and cannot do without yeah. going back to the shareholders and asking their permission. Yeah, so it can be things, uh, you know, like um, giving dividends, you know, acquiring other businesses or changing the nature of what the business does. So they, they usually are quite big ticket items. And what, what I, the point I was going to make was, although the, the different aspects of a shareholders agreement probably won't deviate, and I wouldn't, I'd be surprised if certain things weren't in there. I think what you should try and negotiate and concentrate on is making sure that, that those things fit for your business and what you need to do. So things like consent matters, you know, financial thresholds on what you can lend, they all need to be at the, set at the right level so that you're not, you know, day in, day out having to seek investor approval. It becomes a massive headache for the business. It should be set at a level where, okay, we want to go and acquire a new company now to do a, a bolt on acquisition. That's a key item that you would expect to go and get investor consent for. So I think it's, it's more a case um, of, of being clear and, and that balancing act with the investor in respect that they have to protect their, their money as well. And it's a two way street, isn't it? You can have things like preemptive agreements so they can't sell their shares without offering them back to you first or things like that, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the usual things are, you know, everybody should you know, have, a, have, a, have a say in things and, and should be able to participate if they want to. So if, for example, an investor would always ensure that they have an opportunity to invest further sums of money in the business if you go on and, and seek further investment down the line as well. And it's the same with transferring shares. Um, if you found a third party buyer, you, you would expect to be a participant in that process as well, not to be sort of left behind. 
Um, but I think, you know, just to touch on really what, what Hugh said as well, I think there's a, you know, you can't really do enough in terms of agreeing things as soon as possible and agree as much as possible in kind of heads of terms and term sheets because the last thing you want to be doing when you get into the key documents is having lots of advisors, legal, financial involved then and then obviously that you, you the, the cost is going up every week that you're you're wasting with it back and forth with the documents if you can agree as much as possible as early as possible it's going to save you a lot of time and and, and fees later down the line it does sound like a top tip actually thank you jordan what's yeah. your prediction for um the the landscape over the next few months um i i think you know it feels like it's getting a lot busier in the market and um you know we've, we've had discussions with different um institutional investors and um, different accountancy firms and advisors. And I think there's going to be probably more an emphasis on what they call accelerated m and So where you may have um, distressed situations with companies now that all the, the government funding is coming to an end and furlough schemes are ending, you may see a lot of distressed situations. But I think as well, a lot of companies over the last few months will have been, you know, looking inwards and, and probably stagnating now and need, need a bit of a boost. So maybe that growth funding and, and equity funding is something that is going to really be a big push over the next few months. So these issues are going to crystallise out? Yes, yes. At some point, I think something's going to ha have to happen. I think we, we touched upon it before around, you know, zombie companies and, and, and just, just going along. Something is going to come to a crunch and there is going to have to be some, something that happens with, with investment, I think. Anthony, um, top tip and prediction, please. Right, my top tip would be, um, well, it is my understanding that... Um, um, less than one in 10 of those who wish to go onto a crowdfunding platform actually get accepted onto a crowdfunding uh, website. So in other words, uh, yeah, it is, it is a big number, which means that uh, it's very important from a top to point of view for you to understand all those success factors that you need to have in place before you put in that application, because, um, because it's, you know, it's these, um, sorry, I've just lost my train no, no, of thought. No. I mean, I think basically you're saying that if you haven't got your act together, there's no point going to a crowdfunding platform to for a solution and raising short-term money because you're just not going to be in a position to attract those people. And back to what you said before about those one third rules, it sounds very much as if you've got to have an established brand and be able to articulate it before you can even think about attracting more people to, to your cause. Correct, correct. And when it comes to where crowdfunding is going, you know, I recently uh, attended a two day crowdfunding summit uh, where this particular issue was discussed at length. And there's a tremendous increase in interest around crowdfunding. And I've certainly seen a surge of, of, of interest as well. So I think crowdfunding is certainly, uh, pe people know that it's there and that they're looking for uh, alternative ways of, of, of uh, seeing their way through our current crisis. You're, so you're predicting, you're predicting more crowdfunding rather than less. So it's going to be even correct. more important that people are able to very well articulate because it could get busy and noisy out there. Correct. Correct. Mark, top tip and prediction, please. Okay. Uh, top tip is to be completely realistic about where you are and what type of proposition you have. Uh, whether you're a debt proposition or an equity proposition and then at what stage you are and what type of equity is suitable for you. So whether that is own equity, friends and family investment, business angels, if you're in a sector type of business that's suitable for crowdfunding uh, or if you are suitable for institutional uh, equity uh, and to be very honest with yourself about where, where you are. So, uh, and if you can't be honest with yourself, who would you turn to to be honest with you? Uh, oh, old male accountants and financial planners. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, your accountant help, I think, uh, is what you mean there. <laughs> <laughs> so, your accountant um, should be honest with you. Uh, yeah, it's very easy for um, an advisor uh, to. Uh, yeah, give the benefit of the doubt to get carried away with the, um, the entrepreneur's excitement and want to help out and say, oh yeah, we can do that for you um, without actually sitting down and thinking, yeah, is this the right route for this business? And don't sleepwalk into even more trouble than you've already got. Absolutely, yeah. And your forecast? Uh, forecast, uh, a cop-out cop forecast would be more uncertainty. Uh, <laughs> but actually, um, I think that 
to try and not be too gloomy because uh, although it's easy to, to talk about all the uncertainty, COVID, government support and, and all of that, we mustn't forget that there are many businesses which are doing really, really well uh, at the moment. Uh, there are many which are carrying on more or less as was and there are a lot that are suffering. Uh, but it is not all suffering and all doom and gloom. Um, so let's remember that, I think. It's not all doom and gloom, Alan Thomas. Oh, that's not the way you, sh you should address a banker. <laughs> <laughs> of course it's doom and gloom. Um, I think actually the best thing is to have an, a plan that's understandable and ex executable. So you've got a goal, you can, uh, you can um, divulge that to a third party and it's quite easy to understand it and it seems practical and there's a reason for taking the money on. Not, oh, I'm just going to grow my business. It's got to have, you know, I'm going to grow my business because this means this will happen. I'm going to grow it this way. So you've got to have something, a third party you can quite quickly grasp and that you believe in and you can understand. I think for predictions, it's quite really difficult. I think one of the, the really interesting things, and it's an obvious one, is there's a load of um, sort of government-backed debt out there right now. Next spring, especially thinking about the, uh, the, the leisure and the food sector, um, if that starts to become difficult, I think something's going to have to happen converting that debt to some other form. Um, it could even convert in that to equity, possibly, because it won't be normal equity. We're expecting yeah. good returns. But if they can't pay back and by forcing the repayments, that means the business is going to go. That's not really helping anybody. So that, that would be interesting to see what happens. I think the market always does seem to find adjustments. So the high streets, um, not lending as much unless you are big, strong, and got lots of security. But then there's lots then of second of different uh, the funders that come to the fore. But again, it goes back to understand what the agenda of that funder is before you just take, oh, they're willing to give me money or lend me money. I'm going to take it. Understand what it means when you take it. Being strong and very lendable. That'll be you, Hugh. Um, what's your <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's your top ten sure. prediction? <laughs> yeah. Look, you know, I think there's great opportunities out there. You know, the the weak pound is you know always always provides opportunities for manufacturing. Um, going back to kind of equity bit, getting the right people on the bus. Once you've done that, it's a great space, exciting space to be in. You know, you then got complementary skills and you know the right amount of money sitting in the business to grow by acquisition or whatever you know there's uh, you know I know some there's some very sad stories out there of businesses struggling through covid but the big businesses that are supplying the retailers have uh, invariably had a very good couple of months you know so as alan said you know when these businesses are, the struggling businesses are looking for equity you know perhaps in the spring you know hopefully there's enough welsh businesses there to to join to, to form partnerships and with hopefully complementary skills and access to market, you know, the, the things that we can do to keep growing the sector in Wales. Brilliant. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you very much indeed. I think uh, in summary then, um, one one bit of advice we've had there is before you try raising equity, uh, you know, go get involved yourself. It's like before you um, uh, you sell something, try buying it. So see what you look like if you're on the market. Time seems to be, you've got, you know, uh, you know, take time and think about it carefully. There's a real cost to equity and it's maybe some of it's hidden. Getting the right amount, you, you know, you don't want to keep coming back to, um, uh, if you can avoid it because it's a costly uh, exercise and get professional advice, both in terms of um, the, the finances of it, but also the legalities of it and what you're getting into. Gentlemen, can I thank you all once again for giving up your morning to talk about this. Um, it's, I, I think we've all learned a lot from it. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for all of those people who've taken the time to join us on the webinar. I hope this has been useful for you too. If anybody uh, wants to talk more about some of the issues about equity, the Investor Ready program is there. So please do get in touch and um, we'll see if we can be any further help. So if I can wish you all a great morning. Thank you very much indeed.